we start, Dean? Yep. Okay. Well, um, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Loy Lee Thing. I'm with the Department of Linguistics at Macquarie University. And today I have the great pleasure of having just a conversation with Professor Ophelia Garcia, who is here with us for the 14th International Symposium on Bilingualism. And this conversation is mainly to give her a platform to talk about uh, one of her passions. And that way, I know most of you may have read her work, but I thought there's nothing better than to hear it uh, from the expert herself, right? Not the expert. <laughs> so thank you so much for your keynote on Monday um, on a translanguaging informed critique of research into studying bilinguals and their uh, education. And personally, it was such a privilege for me to hear you speak. Um, and, and thank you too for agreeing to be interviewed on the subject. Um, as I've explained, um, I convene a large second year unit called Introduction to Social Linguistics. Mm -hmm. And of course, we talk about variation uh -huh. and um, we talk about code switching, mm -hmm. but I barely uh, talk about translanguaging. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think it will be such a privilege for them to hear directly from you. Good. Good. And at the same time, um, this uh, video will be made public through Language on the Move. Okay. So others interested in the topic can also access it and use it for their purposes. And once I do that, then please obviously comment on Language on the Move on uh, how you've used this. So I've prepared some questions based on what I imagine my students or anyone new to mm -hmm. translanguaging for that matter would ask. But maybe firstly, would you like to say something? Well, I first want to thank you for this invitation, Loy. This is uh, a real pleasure. I didn't know Loy before uh, yesterday or the day yeah. before, um, but I had read uh, your work uh, and it's a real pleasure to meet you and to be with you and to be with so many wonderful people and here today Pia and Anna who are helping. Um, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. So let me begin. I only have a few questions but obviously we'll follow through mm -hmm. uh, once you respond. But firstly, um, can you maybe explain the essence of translanguaging in the first instance and perhaps sketch its historical development at yeah. the second instance. Yes, thank you. Um, so you say you teach a course on sociolinguistics. So I want to say that my journey with sociolinguistics started with being a student and then a colleague, a friend uh, of Joshua Fishman, uh, with whom I worked for many, many years. Um, so, um, I, I always say, and this is important to say, that uh, Joshua Fishman was a very generous mentor because one of the things he always did with me was to tell me, you have to find the voice within and all the theories that I have taught you are very important to me and my generation, but they may not be important to you and your generation. So that, um, I learned from him all the sociology of language concepts that are traditional, that we all know about. Um, and as I thought about it, as I grew as a scholar, I really realized that it did not fit my life, my community, my life as a bilingual, my community. I'm, uh, as I said, Monday, I think it was Monday, I'm a little jet lagged. Um, I was born in Cuba and came to the United States, to New York City with my family at the age of 11. Uh, so I grew up in a bilingual community. I grew up in a bilingual home. And the issues of language that I learned from sociology of language didn't quite fit my life or my community. So that is where I started to think of how do I find a place for bilingual lives that are not either one or the other, because I kept, uh, I kept being torn, you know, and, and disrupted with this idea of 
uh, theories from the global north and from the United States especially, and then theories from Latin America, uh, which were the closest to me to be able to develop as a scholar, as a Spanish speaker, uh, etc. And yet, neither one nor the other fit my bilingual life. I was living in a space that was not one or the other. Mm -hmm. So um, the work really started and the disruption, I think, of some of the sociology of language concepts. And you don't want to say that disruption to me is not just forgetting about it, but it's thinking of how do you adapt them, how do you negotiate them, right? Mm -hmm. So for example, one big concept that Joshua Fishman was always one, you know, very, um, uh, very adamant about was the concept of language maintenance, language mm -hmm. shift. Um, and, you know, I always said to him, well, you know, really that doesn't quite fit me because uh, there is, and, you know, I've had, I have a chapter in one of his early books where I talk about translanguaging and shift with Baibing. And the Baibing is what the waves do, right? Mm -hmm. The waves go back and forth. It's also what the, the dancing of cha-cha-cha does, yes. right? You go back and forth, right? And so I said to him, no, it's, it can't be just mm -hmm. maintenance and shift. There's something else that's going on. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we talked a lot about it. And, um, you know, I said, well, it's, it can't be just maintenance because language is not like something that you have a, a piece that's from the, at the museum and it's static, mm -hmm. but it's something that you use. So mm -hmm. we, you know, started thinking of, well, language sustainability, which mm -hmm. is, of course, a, an ecological concept. Mm -hmm. So how do you use language in a context that is not just static, that mm -hmm. is not just monolingual? Um, so, you know, that's where it started getting mm -hmm. a little disrupted. Mm -hmm. I must say that to me, the watershed moment was when I read Simfrey Maconey's and Alastair Pennycook's The Disinvention of Language. Mm -hmm. um, Maconey had asked me to write the foreword, and when I read that book, I thought, oh my God, what have I been missing out, <laughs> out of all of this? Um, and I thought, okay, well, um, at that point, I was writing bilingual education in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. And I must say, I had already written the theoretical chapters in the beginning. Uh, but once I read a Maconi and Pinnacle, I said, no, I have to go back mm -hmm. and rethink these mm -hmm. things. And I think part of the tension then becomes the fact that people are right when they say, well, you talked about translanguaging as encompassing code switching. And I did. And it was because... I have those concepts and then I overlaid mm -hmm. the concept of translanguaging on mm -hmm. top of it. Um, so that's how that came about. I, I have to say that, and then I'll stop talking because that's I know right. I, I talk a lot. Um, uh, I had the privilege of really uh, dedicating that book to Joshua Fishman. Mm -hmm. And he and I talked a lot about translanguaging. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that one of the most wonderful things that one can say about a mentor and a mentor who was that important in framing what is sociology of language is that he always allowed me the freedom to be different mm -hmm. and thought okay well that's not the way that I saw it but yes. maybe you're right yes. so this I think that this is a negotiation that we do yes. with young scholars with uh, and he was always gen very generous yes. with yes. my ability to sort of think yes beyond what had he yes. what he had taught me and that's what we yes. all yes. wish for all our yes. students and right? please don't apologize if you talk too much this is what <laughs> this is about but i do want to pick up on uh, what you said and you mentioned that you've touched slightly on code switching right so for those of us particularly myself who have multiple languages yeah. um use them simultaneously for a long time the framework that we have learned to use yeah. to try and understand what's right. going on right. in the conversation in the discourse have always been code switching Absolutely. and of course there are variations to that whether that's code mixing as well and so on so how do you do you distinguish between code mix, code switching and translanguage yes uh, that's a very important question because i think it's essential right mm -hmm. i think the work on, on code switching starts from 
a named language, right? So if you have the concept of a named language and, you know, I start speaking to you the way that I speak at home, which is not the way that I'm speaking now, um, you will say, oh, she's code switching. That is an external perspective, right? To mm -hmm. what bilinguals do with language. Mm -hmm. But from an internal perspective, from my own life, from the way that I interact at home with my husband, mm -hmm. my children, my grandchildren, etc., I'm not code switching. I'm simply using everything that mm -hmm. I have, mm -hmm. right? So that is the that is difference. The okay. difference is one of perspective. The difference is one of thinking that you first start with name languages, which is, of course, um, a, a, a concept that is tied to the nation state, right? Yes. Um, yes. But, and, or, or, and that's what code, uh, the work on code switching mm -hmm. does. And by the way, I am not undermining the work on code switching, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's a, a lens, a yes. theoretical lens that, that is important yes. and that people have and that I myself have used, you yes. know, it's, um, uh, but what I'm trying to think about is another perspective, the perspective not from the named language nation state side, mm -hmm. but from what people do with language, right? Yes. So it's a different take on language, yes. right? Okay. Um, and it's the idea that language is not, again, a, a construct, mm -hmm. an entity that is autonomous, mm -hmm. but it is... Um, it is a, a communicative system that all human beings have. So with the way that you've explained that, and please correct me if yep. I'm wrong, yep. if I were to summarize what translanguages, yep. translanguaging is about, it's a concept that one can utilize as a tool to describe what's going on in the grassroots, in the home, in terms of how multilingual people use the languages in the repertoire in the various domains where they use those languages. Right. So I guess my, the second, so, right. you know, please do comment on that. And I guess the secondary question to that is, so is it a, a is it also a pedagogical tool that one uses for teaching as an approach or is, is it primarily a theoretical lens yes, through which yes. one can look at what's going on. That's a great question. Because the term, as you know, was um, coined in Wales and mm -hmm. it was coined by a, an educator, Ken Williams, whom I have met. Um, and uh, what it was, it was a pedagogical approach. Mm -hmm. It was the idea that well children could not, you know, the way that it was being taught was well, Welsh was being taught separately, completely mm -hmm. from, um, from English. Mm -hmm. And it was the idea that Welsh children had to be in an English-speaking context. They were mm -hmm. bilingual in English, right? So that, they, they, that he couldn't separate the two. And he started experimenting, it was his doctoral dissertation, with the idea that um, one language was used for input, the other language was used for output, so that it was in the same space rather than in two different classrooms or two different spaces or two different mm -hmm. teachers. So that's how the, the term was coined. I think that um, uh, translanguaging, uh, and it was coined in Welsh and translated by Colin Baker early on. Mm -hmm. um, I worked a lot with Colin Baker and I knew the term and when I started thinking about what bilinguals do with language, I took up the term, used it a little bit differently, uh, to really talk about the way that bilinguals do with language, uh, do language. Maybe an unfortunate term, I'm not married to the term, uh, because I think what a lot of people think that translanguaging, again, is just going across languages, yes. right? Yes, yes. Um, um, some people have said to me, drop the trans, just do languaging. <laughs> uh, and maybe, maybe they're right. Uh, so mm -hmm. I'm not married to the term, I'm married to the concept. The yes. concept that, yes. uh, and I'll tell you what I th why I think is important. Because um, if we think of bilingualism as just the addition of two named languages, then we are constantly finding deficiencies yes. in bilinguals, yes. right? Yes. Because the ways that we take up language as bilinguals cannot be the same way that monolinguals take up yes. language, right? 
So we will constantly find deficiencies. Yes. Whereas I think what translanguaging does is uh, it allows us to understand that the, that the deficiency is not in the speaker. Yeah. Because the speakers have phonemes, they have constructions, they have all kinds of, uh, of tools. Uh, so that it's not that they're deficient. The deficiency is in the way that we look mm -hmm. at them, right? So that, for me, is important. Um, and you talk about a, a pedo, the pedagogy, pedagogical approach. I think it's important to consider translanguaging when you're thinking um, of language mm -hmm. education in any kind of way. Uh, I also don't want it to be just a single strategy that people yeah. use. That's yes. why I think the concept that Li Wei gave us of opening up translanguaging spaces mm -hmm. where bilinguals can breathe and be yeah. themselves, I think that's yes. important. And at the same time, I just want to say this, I, uh, I think it's very important to have the spaces mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, sometimes the problem is that we throw out the baby with the bathwater, yes. so we stop saying, well, no, comprehensible input is still mm -hmm. important. Yes. So you have to have a space where that happens. Yes. But within that space, you have to be able to open up mm -hmm. these spaces so that bilinguals can really use all the resources that they have at yes. their disposal mm -hmm. to make meaning. Thank you so much. Um, I, I fully understand your explanation. So I'd like just to end this conversation. Um, on this note, uh, what would you say to those who are uncomfortable with translanguaging because to them it distracts from the objective of ensuring that language learners uh, learn languages as proficiently as they can for full social and economic participation in society right. and the assumption obviously is when you allow for Translanguaging in the classroom, the fear is that that's not going to be achieved. No. I think that's an excellent question, and it's, a, of course, a criticism that I get all the time, not only from um, educators or applied linguists who are doing the teaching of foreign languages or heritage languages. We can talk about the term heritage afterwards, mm -hmm. but. Um, but also from uh, people who are doing language reclamation, et cetera, right? So this question of if we let translanguaging in, will it disrupt um, the, the spaces that we have created? And you know, my answer always is, and I, I think I, I can quote Einar Haugen, who in the, I think in the 1970s said, it is better to bend than to break, mm -hmm. right? So, um, uh, young people who are starting to um, work with a language, to, uh, to uh, take up the language, um, cannot take up the language in the same way that a monolingual uh, from a different nation state takes it up mm -hmm. because our language social socialization has been completely different. Mm -hmm. They have to take it up some way. And the way in which they take it up sometimes differs from that monolingual norm mm -hmm. that we're all, we all have here. You know, I, I uh, work a lot when I was young with um, the concept that one of the civil rights um, people, scholars, his name was Miles Horton, gave us, which is you have to have one eye in where people are and you have to have another eye in where you want people to go, right? Mm -hmm. So. Um, the question for me always is, I go into classrooms where I see, and my work is in the United States, so I mean, I, I can't apologize for that. That's the yeah. truth. Um, but I go into classrooms where there are six-year-olds who are wonderfully curious, who are wonderfully creative, who are wonderfully smart, uh, but yet they then put them in some remedial class mm -hmm. because they lack features of, of mm. the language, right? And um, I think that is what reduces the capacity to really language, right? Mm -hmm. If we are only doing bits and pieces of language, mm -hmm. we're not doing language, mm -hmm. right? So how do we um, uh, make sure that people continue to use language 
in ways that are communicative and in ways that are creative and critical. Mm -hmm. So, okay. yeah. Well, thank you so much, <laughs> Professor Garcia, for such a thought-provoking conversation. And I hope you guys watching this um, learn a lot from this conversation. And um, when I post this in the Language on the Move, I will uh, make available the um, email address of Professor Garcia if you want to um, email her. But of course, for my students as well, you know you're going to have the uh, relevant readings for this. So thank you and enjoy. Thank you, all of you, and thank you very much. Thank I you. Appreciate, uh, I appreciate your taking the time. Oh, to it's, it's wonderful go, to, go. to just. Right. You know, because I was listening to you and you've changed me and I thought, oh, okay. <laughs> so, yes, thank you. But I'll tell you more about it. Okay. Okay.